Welcome to Truth and Testimony, the broadcast, where we teach and discuss the Word of God. You'll also hear about world news and how it relates to Bible prophecy, plus interviews and testimonials from men and women of God who have devoted their lives to serving Yeshua, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, without further ado, let's get to our host, Adrian Scott. Greetings and Shalom. I'm Adrian Scott and I welcome you to Truth and Testimony the broadcast. Come on in. Yeah, we're here for our next video and in this one I am con continuing my series on uh, creation and evolution. And with this particular video, really it's going to focus on dinosaurs but it's about the age of the earth and how old things are um, well you'll see when we get there but uh, I am kind of centering it around the idea of dinosaurs but it's not limited to that but that is going to be basically the topic for this particular video so there you go it kind of set the stage for it and really um, I'm actually going to take the opportunity right out of the beginning I'll say to start I ask that you please give the video a thumbs up share you can comment below or you can email us that information is also going to be available below in the description with that being said uh, the first thing that I would tackle because really this is going to be a centerpiece of pretty much every video in this series is worldviews because all this information really funnels through that um, Again, I've made the contention, and I believe there's only the two worldviews, and that would either be God's worldview, also you can call it the biblical worldview, which because the Bible is God's word, or man's worldview. And the two are mutually exclusive. They do not play nice together, and they do not go together. As a matter of fact, I suppose I would contend that man's worldview came about um, probably as a direct attack by Hasatan, by the devil, but also just really to be in opposition to God's view and God's authority. But it does ultimately affect how we collectively as people perceive our lives, how we perceive the information that we're presented with and the evidence that we see. I say this because, and this, this really can work both ways, but I'm using the example of as a creationist, you know, trying to reach out to someone that may be an evolutionist, which I was, but that if they are really locked into their worldview, which is man's worldview in this case, there's pretty much no amount of evidence that you'd ever be able to show that's going to really rock them because they're ultimately going to filter it that evidence through their worldview and i will give you a great example of that a bit later on but just know that really it is those two worldviews and as it connects to creation and evolution um, um god's worldview or the biblical worldview is that you know the earth and everything all of creation was created by the creator which is god and um in so doing that that happened approximately um six yeah six thousand years ago and man's worldview would be that the universe which <laughs> i love the way one speaker always put it that uh according to the big bang theory ultimately if you strip it down to the simplest form that nothing exploded and became everything but that this happened what was it 13 point something billion years ago that uh the earth formed something like 4.5 billion years ago and that life arose however they figure it they have no theories actually they've got a bunch of hypotheses but they have no evidence they have no substantial theories on how life originated um just like i said a bunch of hypothesis but that that happened about what i think it was something like 3.8 billion years ago so again um according to that worldview a uh, man's worldview universe created about by the big bang about 13.8 billion years ago 
the earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago and life arose by random chance 3.8 billion years ago. Um, I again point out that they have no evidence to that effect. Um, there's nothing that there's nothing directly from that like 13.8 billion years ago that they can use as evidence uh, that would all be gone so they can only look at mechanisms that are occurring today and try to extrapolate from those back that far um, the problem is that there's other explanations for that as a matter of fact like when you look at the age of stars and actually how stars form and whether they form at all which is a, that's a debatable issue and a contentious one, but there's a lot of argument about that because there's no evidence or observable. We've never seen a star form. We've seen stars die. We've seen stars explode, novas and supernovas and whatnot, but we've never seen a star form. So uh, lots of problems trying to come up with an age that old, but it is the ultimate rescuing device of the evolution worldview and man's worldview is that given enough time, anything could happen. You could explain everything away given enough time. The biblical worldview, and perhaps they might argue it's a little too simple, but it is a lot easier that ultimately, if you go through the scriptures, working on the basis that the scriptures are the inspired word of God, that if you go through the scriptures, you can actually add all the genealogies and ages of everyone, going through Adam and his children and his children's children, so on, so on, down the line, um, that you ultimately can add up all of those years, and that's how we come up with round about 6,000 years. There's a couple of gray areas, and that's why we can't definitively say 6,119 years and three months, because there are a few grayer areas, but in a general sense there's enough there that you can put it to that time frame so your worldview just to kind of summarize on that point is how you are going to interpret all that stuff if you have a godly worldview or a biblical worldview then you'll tend to believe the bible and if it says six thousand years you'll go with that the man's worldview will say well the bible is just you know it's a bunch of hokey pokey hocus pocus malarkey that it doesn't actually mean anything and you can't trust anything it says because it's not accurate then you know you can go with well pretty much whatever number you want to put on it which has changed quite a bit throughout time it, it was one period of time and then it increased and it's 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 a number that has gotten exponentially bigger over time because as we've made more discoveries they've needed more time to allow for this you know random change to occur and evolution so that's worldviews in a nutshell. I mean, you could really do an entire video just on that, but I'm going to leave it at that. So now, I kind of did touch on the age of the earth according to the Bible, and that's when you add up, again, all the genealogies. You come up with about 6,000 years. But just to add to that, so it is about 6,000 years ago that uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Roughly around 4,500 years ago, we have the global flood. This is going to connect significantly to everything that we are about to talk about. So one quick thing I'm just going to touch on because there, even within the God, godly worldview, there's still debate and dissension and multiple interpretations of different things. The example I'm thinking of as I'm saying this is that there are some that propose a localized flood rather than a global flood. There's a whole bunch of problems with that. I don't believe that it could have possibly been a local flood. For one thing, I mean, if it was a localized flood, then all they had to do was just sail over there and dock and they'd be fine. So there would be no need to grab two of every animal in the family and survive on the boat for all this time and send out a bird to look for dry land when dry land is about five kilometers that way, you know. So it had to be a global flood. Just me, to me, that's what I think. Um, so then 6,000 years, creation of the world, 4,500 years ago, um, the global flood, and we find ourselves where we are today. So then the next thing would be, um, if we're talking about dinosaurs, 
one question that I asked early on as I was kind of getting introduced to all of this stuff is, um, do dinosaurs appear in scripture, in the Bible? And so there's a, um, the couple things I'm going to get at. First off, one of the basic premises that we need to note is that, is the word dinosaur found in the Bible? And the answer is no. Um, if you go back, and I'll just use the 1611 King James, but you've got the Geneva Bible, you've got all of these early uh, translations of the Bible that predate this, that the word dinosaur did not come about until 1841 and was actually invented by this gentleman by the name of Sir Richard Owen. And uh, yeah, so di Dinosaurias, I believe, I think is the actual thing. And it basically means terrible lizard, which is how he looked at it. So prior to that word, prior to 1841 and, and the uh, creation of the word dinosaur, um, what would they have been called? Because certainly um, there is rife mythology and lore and history relating to these creatures. And if they weren't called dinosaurs, what were they called? Well, basically the answer would be dragons certainly in the Bible, but in cultures all around the planet, we've got stories of dragons. And there's variations on what they're called. I mean, some, some cultures called them sea monsters, serpents, dragons. But uh, as far as the Bible goes, the primary word, and even then, there, there's a couple of variations of this, but the primary word, I would say, is the Hebrew word tanin. And tanin is is translated multiple different ways and we're going to look at a few examples here but um, one of the big ones is translated as dragon so with that in mind uh, we are going to look at a couple of scriptures in this particular case i will be reading from the scriptures institute for scriptural research isr um, i'm going to start in the book of Job. Now, there's actually two passages I'm going to read here. Um, an interesting thing about Job is because basically Job is all of this awful stuff happens to this poor guy and then all of his friends start lecturing him about why all this awful stuff happened. And the stuff that they're saying, so I heard uh, Another speaker that I like said this once, that it's true that they said that, but what they said is not necessarily true. So you need to be careful about how much gravity you're going to put into scripture. In this particular case, I give it a little more weight because it's not one of Job's friends speaking. This would be God speaking. So we are told about a couple of his um, creations that he is sharing with Job. The first of which, and a lot of us have heard this term, is behemoth. So reading that, it is in Job chapter 40, and it's gonna be from verse 15 through verse 24. And again, I'm in the scriptures, but feel free to follow along in any version that you have. Uh, starting at verse 15, see now behemoth, which I made along with you. Now, what does that mean? So we have six days of create, and I am going to kind of stop as I go here. Normally I like to read and then go back, but I'm going to stop as I go on this one. So we have six days of creation, and the seventh day was the day of rest, the Shabbat. So on day six, God created man and the land animals. That would have included dinosaurs, their land animals, even with pterodactyls and different, you know, flying lizards. Um, they're still predominantly land animals. So which I made along with you. So basically at the time I was creating everything and I created you, I created behemoth too and other land animals. So see now behemoth, which I made along with you, he eats grass like an ox. Pause again. If we go back to that creation account, we are told in the beginning that um, all seed bearing plants and fruit and stuff like that was to be food for us, right? It wasn't until after the flood and we got off the ark and started populating and spreading out that meat was opened as an option to eat. Before that, our diet and the animals 
was to be plants and fruits and vegetables and greenery, roughage. So he eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his loins and his power is in his stomach muscles. So he's got a pretty hefty midsection, it would sound like. He bends his tail like a cedar. Quick pause. So there's been speculation that maybe they're talking about some kind of an elephant or a rhinoceros here. I've heard a lot of people discuss this. And I just make the point quickly. I would refer you to go look for any of those videos. Um, Answers in Genesis is a great option. Institute for, for Creation Research is another one. Um, but that uh, he bends his tail like a cedar. If you look at the tail of an elephant or a rhino, it does not look like a cedar. A twig, but not a cedar. So there's some possibilities of what we could be hearing about here. We don't know for sure, but possibly, maybe it could even be something like a Brachiosaurus, right? One of the dinosaur family. Certainly the tail would fill the criteria and the enormous midsection, his power is in his uh, stomach. Um, his bones are like tubes of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the beginning of the ways of El, El being a short form of saying God. His maker brings near his sword, for the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the slender trees, under cover of reed and swamp. The slender trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the stream surround him. See, if a river rages, he is not alarmed. So he's big enough that even if the water goes up a little bit, not going to be a problem. He feels safe, even if the Yarden, the Jordan, gushes into his mouth. Before his eyes shall he be caught with snares or his nose pierced. So there is Behemoth. Um, another example actually just continues the reading and it's right in Job chapter 41 and this is God sharing yet another one of these creatures this would be Leviathan so really this is the entire chapter 41 of Job so let's do it um, starting at verse 1 would you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower would you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Would he keep on pleading with you? Would he speak softly to you? Would he make a covenant with you to be taken as a servant forever? Would you play with him as with a bird or leash him for your young girls? Would trading partners bargain over him? Would they divide him among the merchants, fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Put your hand on him. Think of the struggle. Do not do it again. See, any expectation of him is disappointed. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so foolhardy to wake him up. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has given to me first that I should repay him under all the heavens that is mine? I would not keep silent concerning his limbs or his mighty power or his fair frame who shall take off the surface of his skin, who approaches him with a double, double bridle, who shall open the doors of his face with his frightening teeth all around. Rows of scales are his pride, closed up, a binding seal. One to the other they fit closely, not even a breath enters between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together and are not separated. His sneezings, Flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go firebrands, sparks of fire shoot out. Out of his nostrils come smoke, like a boiling pot or kettle. He sets, his breath sets coals on fire, and a flame goes out of his mouth. Yes, indeed, if this is correct and is taken to be accurate, then we're describing effectively a fire-breathing dragon. I'll come back to that in a minute. Strength dwells, this is verse 22, uh, strength dwells in his neck and fear leaps before him. The folds of his flesh cleave together. They are firm on him, immovable. His heart is as hard as stone, even as hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Because of his crashings, they are bewildered. 
No sword that reaches him does prevail, neither spear, dart, or lance. He reckons iron as straw, bronze as rotten wood. The arrow does not make him flee. Sling stones become like stubble to him. Clubs are reckoned as straw. He laughs at the, at the rattle of a lance. His undersides are like sharp, sharp potsherds. He sprawls on the mud like a threshing sledge. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He leaves a shining path behind him. One would think the deep to be gray-haired. No one on earth is like him, one made without fear. He sees all that is haughty. He is sovereign over all the sons of pride. All of that describing Leviathan. So this isn't just a passing thing. Like That's an entire section of God talking to Job describing this. And yes, um, the possibility of a fire-breathing dragon, before we dismiss that offhand as just the realm of fantasy and Lord of the Rings and Dungeons and Dragons and stuff, you know, I would invite you to take a look even today at the Bombardier Beetle and look at what the beetle does. I don't remember the specifics, but effectively, this is a little critter that, if I remember right, um, bursts out basically burning liquid flame like a flaming liquid a burning liquid and it's quite the mechanism that does it like something actually sparks this inside its body and and it does it's it's an amazing thing if you spend a little time and just look at at how a bombardier beetle operates it's it's uh it's pretty impressive but my question or my point would be if god can do that with a teeny little creature like that could he make something larger breathe fire you know, as, as uh, Yeshua said, I think in the book of Matthew, right, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things. Not some things. All things are possible. So there's that reference. And one more quick one is going to be uh, in Isaiah 27. And it is just verse 1 in Isaiah 27. And it says... In that day, Yehovah, with his severe sword, great and strong, punishes Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent. And he shall slay the monster that is in the sea. So one more reference to Leviathan. There's actually a couple more. I think there's another one in Ezekiel. and there, There's a couple of other places where you get it. But I'll leave that one at that. On a more general sense, um, back to the word tanin, um, the Hebrew word for dragon, we do get references of that. And uh, I'd like to just quickly take a look at a couple of those. There are many. And as I pointed out, they do have some different um, translations to them. They're used differently. Sometimes, a lot of times, it's dragon. But it's also been translated as serpent, sea monster, and some other variants like that. But all within that basic realm. In this case, um, all these ones I'm going to mention it does specifically translate as dragon. So the first one is in Yirmiyahu, or Jeremiah, and it is chapter 51. And we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And it says, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the sovereign of Babel, has devoured us. He has crushed us. He has made us an empty vessel. He has swallowed us up like a monster. He has filled his stomach with my delicacies. He has driven us away. And that like a monster, if you look in a lot of other versions, it does say dragon there. And it is behind that, the Hebrew word tanin. And the next one is found in the book of, okay, now the proper or closer to proper way to say this in Hebrew would be Nehemiah or Nehemiahu. But we often hear it in English as Nehemiah, but it is chapter 2 and verse 13. And additionally, this is a great example of getting into a word study. Because you'll see here in a second. So first, I'm actually going to read this one from two versions. I'm going to start with the scriptures. So it says in uh, verse 13 of Nehemiah chapter 2, And I went out by night through the valley gate to the jackal's fountain and the dung gate, and examined the walls of Jerusalem or Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which were burned with fire. It is that word, jackal. 
And if we go over, I'm going to go to the King James, and we'll see here. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. So the King James has translated it as dragon. It is the Hebrew word tanin, which would translate as dragon, or sea monster, or serpent. Yet somehow, in the scriptures, shame on you scriptures, they have translated it as jackal. I don't know if I'm aware of any other instance where it's translated as jackal. It may be. But uh, that's a new one for me. I'm just kind of discovering this right now as I'm reading it. So there you go. Um, so that would be a great opportunity to pull out that Brown Driver Briggs and start looking these things up, you know, concordance to the scriptures and stuff. So there's Nehemiah or Nehemiah. And the last one that I want to take a look at takes us over to the book of Micha or Micah. Uh, and it is chapter 1, verse 8. Here we go again. I just noticed this as I brought it up. It says, because of this, I lament and howl. I go stripped and naked. I make a lamentation like jackals and a mourning like ostriches. They've done it again. They've done it as jackals. And just to make the point, I'm going to pop over to the King James here real quick. I love having a digital Bible because I can get all these uh, various versions all right there in one device. Um... And it says in the King James, the same verse, verse 8, Micah chapter 1, it says, Therefore I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the dragons and mourning as the owls. There's, there's another difference. They do owls in King James, ostriches in the scriptures. This is all stuff that then gets me going. It's like, okay, why are they translating this differently? But you can see there's differences. So those are the passages I will mention. Again, there are a lot of others. There's stuff in the Psalms and things like that, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, so kind of just recapping up to this point, because I'm going to do the latter part of this video on a particular topic, and that is evidences, but just recapping where we are. Um, Earth is, according to the biblical worldview, Earth is about 6,000 years old, 4,500 years ago, great flood. Dinosaurs created the same day as man was created and dwelt with man. And there's actually examples archaeologically here um, in geology and stuff where they have found what appear to be um, set in stone footprints of humans and dinosaurs together. Right? You'd think if we've got all these different layers, according to the geologic column, that you know man's footprint should be way up here and dinosaur's footprint should be way down here. But they find same layer, all these footprints on one thing. And there's photographic evidence of that, um, a lot out there. But um, that's an interesting one. So created at the same time, which therefore means that dinosaurs would have also been on the ark with Noah. And I hear a lot of times, this is a common one, is like, well, how would they fit dinosaurs on the ark? They're so big. Well, the big dinosaurs were big, but the little dinosaurs were little. Now, that's actually a sarcastic way of making a point. Not all dinosaurs were the huge ones like the Brachiosaurus and stuff like that, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Many of the dinosaurs, perhaps even the majority of dinosaurs that we're aware of, were actually of the slightly smaller variety. Plus, I would make a case, and this could apply to any number of other animals that they would have brought onto the ark, that... Um, they would have brought little ones, young ones, right? Because A, they're going to be smaller, just simple logistics in that one. B, they'll be easier to feed and care for. And C, they'll live longer once the ark lands and they all disembark and settle out because they'll need time to start repopulating. So for those three reasons, I really believe that they would have brought the young on. So they would have had young dinosaurs and good chance they would have had some of the smaller dinosaurs because it's all about having two of each kind. Seven of each clean kind, but two of each kind of animal. And I know I've talked about this before, but that idea of we've got all kinds of variations of dogs, but ultimately, 
you know, there's just a basic number of dogs. They're, they're all dogs. So you only need one male and one female dog because the variants genetically for all the variations of dogs are present within those two. Same would hold true for any other animal, including the dinosaurs. So then what happened to the dinosaurs after they got off the ark, if they were on the ark? Well, I would suspect there's actually a few things that a lot of this is hypothetical and theoretical. It's speculation, but it makes sense based on circumstances and, and just common sense, I would think. So one thing would be now um, dinosaurs and man did not coexist very well. Um, dinosaurs would have been eating man potentially even though they were plant eaters before, again, after the ark, for lack of vegetation, which has predominantly been wiped out, diet of necessity would have needed to change. So that could be one thing. And man, much like as we, even in today's world, when we move into a, an unpopulated area and start populating it, and there's many times wild animals there, you know, bears and coyotes and stuff like that, that we either drive them away or hunt them out and get rid of them. And uh, so same thing would have happened with the dinosaurs. So that's one. Number two, um, and this one's a bit more interesting, but I think it's at least plausible, right? Is the idea that there's some thought that the atmosphere on the earth was significantly different before the flood. Um, possibly even a canopy of ice or, or solidified water because there's a scripture of the waters above the heavens and the waters beneath the heavens. Um, that It's a theory, but that there could have been something like that and it would have created an ideal environment, keeping a, a perfect temperature and allowing for an enriched oxygen atmosphere. Now with dinosaurs getting as big as they did, their oxygen demands would be that much higher, I would think. Now with the collapse of that and the great flood and everything that afterwards they were grew to be too big to have to they couldn't get enough air to keep going and they just kind of petered out and died that way at least the big ones right and then the rest could be hunted out there is all circumstantial and you could even go as far as to say hearsay in some cases, but there is some evidence that there may be some dinosaurs or very close relatives to dinosaurs still dwelling around today. I know it's a fanciful one, but the idea has been thrown out that we have all of these sightings and supposed photographs, alleged photographs and documentation of the Loch Ness Monster or for us Canadians here at Ogopogo, um, that that could have been a plesiosaur, which is another dinosaur. And there's stories from the Amazon of uh, different tribes of people that reporting what closely, apparently, resembles pterodactyls. I actually, are they called pterodactyls? I know some of those names were wrong, like we just call them brontosaurus, but it's, that's not an accurate name. Flying dinosaur, anyways. And uh, but reports of that. So there is a possibility that there may still be a few kicking around. Um, not many if there if there is, but uh, that possibility could exist. I think predominantly they're gone. So is there evidence today of dinosaurs in a young earth, right? So again, this is one where you got to look at the secular or evolutionary worldview um, utilizes something they call the geologic column. Um, I don't know if he was the inventor, but he was an early pioneer and an early user. If he wasn't the inventor, he may have been the inventor, but Charles Lyell um, working with the geologic column. But it's basically that each of these rock layers represents, you know, millions of years here, 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 here. And you've got the, I mean, we've heard the, a lot of the terms, the Cretaceous and the Jurassic and all these different layers. Um, but this geologic column, based on that view, puts the dinosaurs down at a particular point where they would have been, I think it's something like three to five hundred million years old or something, something in that vicinity. So this connects to what I'm going to talk about. So the idea is that there has been 
And originally, I thought it might have only been one or two kind of one-off, so maybe that there was something wrong with it or, or they misinterpreted something. But they have just been finding this over and over and over again are these fossils, not just dinosaurs fossils, but including dinosaur fossils, that are being found with soft tissue on them. And in extreme cases, soft tissues that they've actually been able to make malleable again, that they could stretch and it stayed intact, it stretched without breaking. I think probably one of the biggest um, examples of that was um, Dr. What's her name? Um, I believe Mary Schweitzer. And uh, she actually did some tests where she was actually able to make she effectively like reconstituted this tissue and it was it became pliable she was actually able to stretch it furthermore she actually went on in in either that finding or another similar finding to find more soft tissue with dried blood cells as well now the whole thing is to the best of my knowledge and i'm not a biologist or a geneticist or anything like that but the best of my knowledge there is known known method of preservation to preserve soft tissue and blood for three to five hundred million years um so it really through when that when these discoveries started being made because like i said by this point there's a lot of them but when these discoveries started to be made um it really threw a wrench in the evolutionary view what i find interesting to bring it back to the whole worldview thing is and in the case of uh Dr. Schweitzer there, that when she looked at this, there's no denying what she was looking at. That is empirical ev uh, scientific evidence right there in front of her face that she's manipulating with a pair of tools, right? So you can't, it's hard to dispute that when you got it right there. She couldn't possibly accept the idea that the earth is any less than 4.5 billion years old and that these things lived, you know, three to 500 million years ago that instead it's like, well, there must be some completely undiscovered, unknown chemical reaction going on that's preserving these things, right? Because we have no known way that it could happen. So there's clearly some way we don't know that it is happening because that's the whole thing about that, that worldview. They just can't see that this is pointing towards a young earth and that these fossils, these bones are not as old as they think they are. That just makes more sense to me, right? I used to believe that way. Now I believe this way. And I started hearing about this evidence and I'm just like, well, pfft, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that lines up with the Bible pretty accurately, right in, right in about the same time frame. Because now if you're talking about sustaining soft tissue for 4,500 years, that's doable. Blood, that's doable. 300 million, 400, 500 million years old, not doable. So which worldview makes more sense? And again, I have to say, I stress, I give all the glory to our creator in heaven, the father, because it wasn't through my own brilliance and my own deductive, awesome powers of deduction and reasoning that I came to this conclusion. I was locked into my viewpoint, much like they are. It was God that for whatever reason, maybe it, maybe it was for me to be here now doing these videos. He chose to open my eyes that I would see those things. And, uh, you know, sometimes I almost wish he hadn't <laughs> because I can see just the, oh, the nastiness that's going on in the world. And, you know, it's like, I don't want to get off on too much of a rabbit hole, but I've certainly, one of the most common things I hear is Christianity has been the source of how much blood has been spilled in the name of Christianity. Well, you know what? Sadly, there has been a lot of blood spilled in the name of Christianity. But number one, I would contend that they weren't actually Christians that were doing it. They were just flying the flag. They were claiming it, but they weren't actually living it. And number two, that uh, evolutionists and secularists and atheists are responsible for a lot more bloodshed than Christians are. Just my opinion. So anyways, soft tissue. Now what's interesting about this is if you look at the geologic column 
um, you've got all these ages and man is up here and dinosaurs are somewhere down here but right towards the bottom the oldest sort of identified era is what they call the Cambrian or Precambrian era that they are now finding soft tissue samples in even up to Precambrian um, what should be Precambrian rock layers they're finding fossils and finding soft tissue now Precambrian, I, I don't even want to speculate how far back that's going. If the dinosaurs are as old as they are, and Cambrian is going back a long time before that, right? Now, from the global flood worldview, what do we have? Well, then the Cambrian layer would simply have been the first layer put down with the Great Flood, with the global flood, right? And then all the other layers were rapidly put down on top of that. And if all of that happened over a relatively short period of time, um, and that was only about 4,500 years ago, that would explain soft tissue all the way back to the oldest layers of this geologic column. Geologic column is not real, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm not going to get into a big debate on that one, but it, it's, a, it's another theory, and it doesn't hold. Um, because again, I would just say that those columns, those layers were simply laid down over a short period of time during the event of the global flood, but they find soft tissue all the way back to that period, which has no right existing. So right into the, so the Cambrian period, this would predate dinosaurs according to their reckoning, right? But they still find it in the one example that I saw and I don't understand all of the details behind it. it was basically some form of worm and these tubes that they basically lived in. So they find remains of these tubes that still have soft tissue. This goes back supposedly to the Cambrian era, however many millions and millions of years ago. But uh, either way, they find soft tissue in there. So there have been a couple of uh, examples that I have put up on screen. There are a lot more, and I just encourage you, go digging for them yourselves. Sometimes it can be awkward to find because there's a lot of secular science out there that even though these discoveries are being made, they are attempting to suppress it. So you don't see the headlines of this stuff, even though you really should be, you know. Um, but that's, I mean, that's pretty much it. I, um, there's other examples of stuff. I just wanted the, the soft tissue was kind of the main, the main uh, gist of, of where I was going to go with this video. But there are other evidences, um, anthropological, geological evidences for dinosaurs being younger than they believe and um, evidences to that effect. So I think I will pretty much wrap it up there. Hopefully this has wet your appetite enough that you're wanting to go and look into this stuff yourself. Again, I would just mention real quick Answers in Genesis. They're, they're a good source for stuff like that. Uh, Institute for Creation Research. That's another one, ICR. They have some really good people there. These are accredited um, scientists. They are um, geneticists and anthropologists and geologists and like they are degreed they've gone to school and they can talk about these things in a lot more detail with a lot more authority and examples than I can provide my video here is just really an attempt to sort of pique the interest and hopefully you know encourage someone to go and look for that stuff I spent a lot of time listening to other people and I have to say that as I'm not a scientist myself, um, I really do have to defer to what I'm hearing from these guys. But as much as I can, um, I like to try and connect it back to the scriptures and just that, you know, it's internally consistent and um, lines up with what God's word says. So on that note, I will wrap up the video. Again, I thank you very much. If you stuck with it to the end, yay. Thanks so much for being here. Again, give the video a thumbs up. Um, share. Share it with your friends, right? If, if you have anyone that's wondering about this stuff, or point them to one of those uh, resources that I've mentioned. But uh, share, comment below if you have any comments. Or you can email us. And uh, we do check out that stuff. So... I don't get to it every day, but I get to it when I can. And I uh, just, again, I appreciate you being here. 
and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next video. So I wish blessings to all of you. I just pray that you would have a great day and a great week and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Shalom. Bye for now. You've been listening to Truth and Testimony, the broadcast. If you have a comment, please leave it on the bottom of this video or email us at truthandtestimonyemail at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Truth and Testimony, the broadcast is not affiliated with Truth and Testimony magazine.